game. They did it. They did it. They did it. And they're going crazy. They're jumping on each other. One of the most unbelievable finishes you will ever see. And welcome to it. Thanks for being with us here on Orioles Magic, the podcast. Brett Hollander and Jeff Arnold. And Jeff, uh, you know, there are a few utility players that really stand out in my mind. Uh, but if you had to paint a picture of what a utility player should be like and how he kind of plays the game, how truly uh, he can play anywhere in the field, uh, that'd be Jeff Rebelay, who's coming up on our uh, podcast today. Just a guy who hung around baseball for 12 years. And you know he brought a lot to the table if you have 12 years of big league service and only 20 home runs, but yet played a lot of games and played a lot of different positions. And that's the whole thing about it is if you're a utility player and you spend 12 years in the major leagues, that's unbelievably difficult to do. I mean, you said it in the podcast, I don't think he played in any more than 109 games in any single season, but Reveille was so good for the Orioles against Randy Johnson. I mean, his OPS against Johnson, I think, was around like 811 or something like that. Had a couple of different home runs, including one really big one in that ALDS game uh, that we're talking about in this podcast. Yeah, we get into a lot with Jeff Reveille, so enjoy every bit of it. His post-baseball life, uh, his relationships with guys like Kirby Puckett, he played all around, so he got to meet a lot of baseball guys. And one thing I'll say about Jeff Reveille as far as a guy you're interviewing, his recall is off the charts. So a really interesting conversation. But, of course, for Orioles fans, uh, he played here for three seasons and hit one monster home run. And joining us right now on Orioles Magic, the podcast presented by Miller Light is someone who uh, connected with some Orioles Magic back in 1997 when he hit – a playoff home run off Randy Johnson, a part of an Orioles uh, playoff series win over the loaded Seattle Mariners. Joining us right now, a guy who played in 12 big league seasons, three with the Baltimore Orioles, Jeff Rebele. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Oh, man, it's great to be here. Appreciate you guys having me on. Well, let's uh, talk about that October day in Baltimore. Orioles and Mariners, best of five series. It would end up being the clinching game for Baltimore and you hit a home run off Hall of Future Hall of Famer Randy Johnson. Yeah it was uh it was a good day uh, it was one of those afternoon games and I was batting in the two hole behind Brady and uh it was you know it's kind of like a shadowy day so ended up uh got a 2-2 pitch that was uh off the plate called a ball got the 3-2 and got a fastball and was able to uh like I like to say a blind squirrel finds an acorn and uh <laughs> put it in the left center for me uh, you know, obviously it was a great moment running around the bases, but I can't hit a home run unless a guy's throwing over 90. And of course, Randy can do that. So that's how, uh, I think that's how that happened. You had a lot of success against Randy Johnson in your career. What, what do you think were some keys to, to being able to get that many hits and a couple of home runs off of uh, the big unit? Yeah. Um, I played against him a lot in the minor leagues as well. So I'd seen him probably 50 plus times in the minor leagues. And then, because you played a lot of games against the same teams. And then uh, throughout my career, I just, uh, I think in Minnesota, I got my first start at first base, learned first base in an, in an hour and a half before the game started and gave Ken Herbeck a day off. And I had pretty good success against Randy. And so from then on, I just kept kind of like having days. And and for whatever reason, I, I don't know if it's my approach or what, but uh, all the, every time we played him, whatever team I was on, we've always done well. So I guess I was, I don't know, I feel like you got to get him early. Uh, once good pitchers get locked in, it's kind of over. And uh, it was kind of like that in that series. You know, and Mike Mussina was unbelievable. They couldn't get to him. And he just pitched lights out. And uh, we were able to get to Randy a little bit early and make him uncomfortable. And I think we just hung on enough. Had enough it's, am on. it's amazing we look at Johnston's line. I mean, he goes the distance in the game in a loss. He strikes out 13 Orioles. But you do just enough. You hit one. Geronimo Barroa hit one. And you mentioned Mike, who, you know, going in on paper around Baltimore, we understood what Mike was about. But I think on the uh, national stage, uh, no one would put those two necessarily in the same class of pitching. Yeah, I mean, uh, Musina was unbelievable during that time. That was the best I've seen him throw. Like, he was just nails. And even into the Cleveland series, he was unbelievable. Um, 
the, the one thing about Randy is, and I kind of pass this information on to guys as I play with him, like he's going to strike you out. Like he's going to get at least one guy. He, he's going to get everybody once and some guys twice and maybe some guys three times. I so you just got to get that one hit. You got to really like make him work. And I think that was the approach we all kind of had. And, you know, you know, I think Musina outpitched, you know, uh, Randy Johnson, which is hard to do, right? Because he's one of the best in the games ever. And, um, you know, it was just a great series for us. Uh, I was glad to be a part of it. Didn't do a whole lot in the first game. I laid down a sack bunt with two, two strikes, and that's kind of an interesting story. But uh, then I think Eric Davis drove in the next – the guys to put us ahead. And we kind of went on to win those games pretty easily, nine to three, I think. And then uh, they came back at our place and won. And then we were able to do it in game uh, game four, which was the game that I hit the one in the first inning. And like you said, you talked about all these guys, but there was a lot of guys that had great series. And I know I can think of Barroa had an unbelievable series. Cal played great. Uh, Bordick played great. And, of course, Musina was, you know, Mike Musina. Davey Johnson elected to start uh, a – couple of different right-handed hitting lineups against Randy Johnson. It ended up working out, but you also sat through your best left-handed batters. You, you didn't have Roberto Alomar. You didn't have Rafael Palmero. Um, DJ Serhoff didn't play either. What, was there any surprise at all that you would maybe have, have sat those guys uh, before, you know, the results ended up working out the way that they did? Yeah, there were some question marks to that. I think the media plays more into that. During the season, like we said, we played the right-handed lineup and beat him, I think, every time. So, you know, in hindsight, you look at it, I look back on it and I know, you know when you're playing to the media, Davey Johnson, you know, it took some guts for him to put that lineup out there. Clearly you're sitting Alomar and playing me that there's, you're, you're putting your, you know, your butt on the line there. And, uh, you know, I think we did enough and, 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 you know, you don't want to mess with success, but there's going to be a lot of talk about that, right? When you have such a disparity between players, you know, you got a utility guy and you got a guy who's, you know, for surefire Hall of Famer, right? So at that time, I think Robbie had a little shoulder issue and they kind of said something about that, but he was, he could hit pretty good. I think I just faced Randy Johnson pretty well. And, and, uh, but I do know this, there's a spot in the game, every game, but in the first game, I think it was in Seattle and I had just come up to hit again. And I think I made an out or something and we were up a pretty good amount, whatever it was. And Davey comes to me at the end of the dugout and he's like, I got to take you out. And I look at him, I'm like, I totally get it. Like, if I make an error and cost us three runs or something, and he's got a Hall of Fame, you know, gold glove infielder, that's perennial gold glover at second base, and he didn't take him out, like, his, you know, he's really in trouble. So, uh, so we made that move, and I totally get that. But I, I talked to him later on. I appreciate him putting me in there because it did take guts. And, and uh, of course, he appreciates me doing well for him and making him look good. Jeff, uh, that Orioles team wins 98 games. They go wire to wire, best regular season record in baseball. But I think the consensus in baseball, and certainly Baltimore fans felt this way, that the Orioles were somehow underdogs in this series uh, to the Seattle Mariners. I think if you count it out, there's six or seven Hall of Famers between the two teams in this series, and yeah. that's excluding Alex Rodriguez uh, right now. Uh, it was a heavyweight fight, but I mean, I know what happened in the LCS, obviously, but it's certainly a validation of how good that team was in 1997. Yeah, it, I think the, the, the concept was you didn't want to face Seattle because you're going to get Randy Johnson twice, right? So that was the big thing. And, and if you can get by Randy, then, you, you know, you're in good shape. So, uh, you know, us, you know, I think we have more Hall of Famers than they do right now. Uh, we had a great team. You know, I look at teams, I look back on that. We could have won a lot more games. We went through a stretch later on where later in the year we lost some games and we were winning like a 700 win percentage clip and we lost a few games in a row and the Yankees started closing a little bit and we're like, okay, the guys just turned it back on. Right. And uh, that was how good we were. We had guys on the bench, you know, Harold Baines is on the bench for, you know, crying out loud. That's, that tells you how good that team was and the players we had. So um, yeah, that was big. Um, it was just a great experience for me. I think the, you know, just being on a great winning team like that and knowing how good we were, uh, it was it was fun to be a part of that in Baltimore. How much of a role did, did Davey Johnson have in that team, uh, making it as successful as it was? I think uh, when you're in it at the time, you're not really sure. Um, I think the true sign for him was when he left. And, you know, 
there was a lot of times I didn't think he was making decisions. He kind of let the guys play. About the seventh inning, you'd look down at the end of the dugout, and, uh, you know, you, you weren't sure what he was doing the first six innings, you know. But uh, he'd look down there all of a sudden, you know, late in the game in, a, in, in uh, the American League, you know, that's when things start clicking. You could watch down there. He knew what was going on. He made all the right moves on the pitching side. And, uh, you know, I, I know uh, Ray Miller was a pitching coach at the time, but Davey made a lot of those calls, man. And, and it really, it, it showed up. And uh, he got his guys ready to go and he let us play and, and we were talented as heck. So I give him a lot of credit. I really do. I think he was, uh, I think he was a very good manager. He was very good with a lot of talent. And uh, we had that. And I think, uh, I think it was a good time for the Orioles to have him in 97. Really good rotation that year with Mussina, Key, Erickson, and Kamenicki had a good year, but a great bullpen. I mean, you can make a case it's one of the best oh, yeah. bullpens in baseball history. Uh, not only was it full of guys who had great seasons from Rhodes and Orozco and Alan Mills and Armando Benitez, but Randy Myers, yes. uh, he, well, he goes 45 of 46, I think. Yeah, it was something ridiculous, man. I mean, it's, you know, Randy, I mean, he just has a, I don't know what he has. He has the disappearing fastball. Like he throws a fastball up there. They just can't see it. I don't know what happens, but um, you know, and he just was coming at you and here it is. And, and uh, just was awesome that year. And you're right. The bullpen was unbelievable. I mean, Arthur Rhodes comes into middle of games and, and vultured in about seven or eight wins just in middle relief. Like, you know, cause we knew we were going to put up points. I mean, how could you not put up points with that lineup? And uh, so Arthur would keep us around. He maybe a right-hander would have a tough day and they had a lefty lineup and he would go in there and mow them down for three or four innings. And then, you know, when the game got tough, we got ahead, man, when they had, that back end of the bullpen was unbelievable. So you can see, I mean, you just have to go back and look at it. You don't realize it at the time. We knew we were good, but you look back and, those, you know, we got Hall of Fame. I mean, we got all-star players that are on the bench, you know, Hall of Famers sitting on the bench. You know, it was pretty impressive. You added a, a great defender in Mike Bordick who would play at shortstop and then Cal shifted over the, to third base. How did Cal handle that, that transition and what was it like playing with him? Oh, it was awesome, man. I mean, that was two, of, two of my favorite players to play with. I mean, just, you know, uh, Mike Bordick can catch a ground ball and throw it to first base, man. I mean, that is just, that's something. You hit it to him and it's, it's an out, right? And Cal was learning third. Um, but, you know, he's always been a great defender and he's long and lanky and, and he's going to put every part of his mental game into that and learning how to do that and, and be the best at it. Uh, I noticed that, uh, you know, he, he's been playing a while, right? And uh, clearly a lot of games in a row. And, uh, you know, he was playing third base in spring training. He would take a lot of grounders. And he was working on his angles and his throws. And about halfway through the year, I'd go over there because, you know, in, in batting practice, you would go up to him and I'd start with, uh, with Cal, see if he wanted any throws at second. And Robbie would uh, would take some grounders or he would go in and hit. And then Bordy was the last one to go in and hit. And then the utility guy would bat in the in the group four. So I would catch all the guys first, make sure they were good to go, because that's what you do as a utility guy. And Cal, halfway through the year, stopped. I'm like, hey, you want you want some at third? And he's like, no, I'm good. I'm good. So I, I knew he was feeling comfortable about playing third base at that time. And he's saving his arm, you know, because it's a long season. And he was putting a lot of work from spring training on to, to be the best at third base. And he really did a nice job of that, you know. And obviously he's, you know, who he is and he thinks about every position and how he's going to, you know, how he's going to decide cutoffs differently at third. He's going to try everything that's never been done before. Like that's his mindset is I'm going to figure out ways – to make myself as better than everybody else. And I'm going to analyze every situation and try and figure out how to do it best. And that's what he did. What was it like to see Roberto Alomar play second base on a daily basis as a infielder? It was awesome. And again, taking ground balls. If you didn't get there before early to watch batting practice, like you missed it because that's when he got a lot of ground balls. Right. So he would go over there and, and after Cal would throw his, I would get uh, Robbie, and I would just stand it short at, at, at the base, and he would do these back flips from almost first base, backhand flips, and he would take his glove and swat it at me. It would come, ground ball come flying at me, he'd just take his glove and swat it right here on the stick every time. And I'm like, this is unbelievable. And then his last one would always be, I think Sammy Perlaza would roll, hit one in the hole, like almost by first base, slow. And he'd run over and backhand behind him and swat it back to me. And sometimes it would go all the way to me. 
and I'd catch it. I mean, that's just, I mean, I know those are fancy things, but he was that talented. He'd go between his legs and he would flip and then he would just do his normal flips. So, uh, you know, he was just that talented quick. What I was most impressed with is I, I'll say this, you know, to the day I die, people ask me like, who is the most, uh, who's the best player you ever played with? And honestly, I think talent wise, it was Robbie Alomar. When I, Robbie Alomar wanted to play, he, he was a five tool guy and he would turn it on. I mean, he, I saw a game where Clemens threw at him in Toronto, uh, kind of woke him up a little bit and it was a battle and they were screaming at each other. And then he, after about five, six more pitches, rifled one off the right center field wall and he was standing on third. I, I thought he was going to go for four. Like he was flying. And so you, you, that's the kind of talent level we were dealing with, you know, and that's, you know, again, it's just another clog in why we did so well. He was a great player. That 97 Orioles infield was the best defensive infield that you were a part of in your big league career? Yeah, I, I would, yeah you have to say that. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I know Palmero got a gold glove or whatever, and he dropped his 40 bombs a year, 140 RBIs. Um, and it, it, the gold glove thing can kind of be an offensive position thing at times. So if you don't hit, you may not get it. So I think Bordy got, uh, you know, I know he was dealing with uh, Vizquel a little bit too, but until Bordy hit, he didn't get his gold gloves, right? And the dude ran off like, what, he would go a whole season or something plus and not making an air? And he didn't make one again until he became a utility guy in Toronto. I give him crap about that. He was playing third and made an error. <laughs> so I say, he's like, it's hard. I'm like, well, it's hard playing every day too. Trust me. You know, that aches and pains of that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, and Cal playing third, he was so solid. And, you know, just the extra guys we had, you know, even the, the backup guys like myself and, you know, uh, Aaron Ledesma, whoever came up was, you know, it was a serious thing. We played defense and trust me, guys like Randy Myers, uh, I can remember playing Atlanta. It was a ground ball up the middle, and I'm playing second. And it's a, it's like a, we're up by one, and there's a guy on second or third. And I caught the backhand pretty far up the middle and made the play, flipped it over there. And after the game, he's like, you better make that play. And I'm thinking, wow, that's kind of crazy. But, you know, that's just the way Randy was. But they expected you to perform, right? I mean, you go out, this is a professional game. And uh, we were, you know, number one in our division and probably the best – like you said, the best uh, record in baseball. And we went out there and did it every day on defense, pitching. Je Jeff, I love your baseball reference uh, page. 12 seasons, no more than 109 games in any one of them, no more than 240 at-bats. And let me read off this. 261 games at second, 342 games at short, 240 games at third, 40 at first base, 24 in the outfield, and one catching. One I catching. Mean, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was I, – I, I was, somebody mentioned it to me the other day. They're like, well, you didn't pitch. And I'm like, well, if I don't know it was such a big deal, you know, they talk about these guys playing all the positions. I'm like, I could have done that. The catcher's the hard one. Pitching was – I got. I did get uh, – uh, interesting story. I did pitch in double A in a blowout game, and I faced David Howard, who was in the big leagues, Tommy Dunbar, who played a long time in the minor leagues in Japan, and then uh, I got Jeff Conine out. So I give him crap when I play with Niner the next year. Uh, or the next two years. And uh, yeah, so I, I could have pitched. I actually, you know, I would sinker and a change up any time. So I figured throwing 85 wouldn't be good. I'd rather throw 82 with a little sink. And uh, that worked out because I think 85 is pretty much batting practice speed. So that wouldn't have been good. Do you remember the game that you caught at all? I do. It wasn't good. Yeah. We, uh, our starting catcher, uh, Matt Walbeck, was hurt and the backup started, they pinch hit for the backup. I was the emergency catcher. And I would catch once every spring, you know, just to get some innings in. And I caught a lot of bullpens. And uh, Matt Walbeck was hurt. And they, he wanted to go back in the game because he knew we were going to have to pinch hit. So I pinch hit for the catcher. We didn't tie it up. We're down one. I think it turned into a, like a – I think they scored four or five. Wasn't good. They stole on me. I almost threw him out, but I bounced at the second. I ran up the line. Uh, it was just a – it was a great experience, but uh, not a fun experience while you're going through it because everything we threw up there, I'm like, I'm obviously not very good at calling pitches because they were getting rocketed everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so – and then when it bounced in the dirt, I wasn't a block guy. I was a shortstop, right? So I just pick everything with my hands. I was just – and I think finally somebody bounced one in front of the plate and bounced over my head. So I got I let one get by me, but – uh, other than that, it was, you know, it was pretty cool to say I caught an inning in the big leagues. And it was actually a meaningful inning. It wasn't like 
we're up by 20 or down by 20. It was, it was a tight game. So it didn't work out, but it was fun. Jeff, the daily preparation for all the positions you could play. I mean, I think, you know, maybe the average fan says second, short, third, what's the difference? But uh, for you on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to keep yourself in the big leagues, uh, take us through that. Yeah, I mean, when I came up, um, I actually got one chance to start in Minnesota. Um, I had gotten moved around. I was a shortstop through the minor leagues. And then they, uh, they had some higher picks than me that came in or trade. Andy McPhail had made a trade. And so they moved me around. He didn't like playing. The kid didn't like playing third because it was too close. Um, so I ended up having to play third, second, move me around. And that ended up obviously being my tool because I was going to play defense. And, you know, when you're a solid defender, you can pretty much play anywhere as a defender. If you can play short, you can play all the other ones. And so I was able to do that. Um, and then that kind of kept me around in the organization for a longer time. I was kind of a suspect. You know, there's prospects and then there's suspects. I became a suspect and just kind of hung around, uh, became a utility guy behind starters in double A again for like my fourth year. But I was able to get a break. Scott Leas made the team with Mike Pagarulu at third. They ended up winning the World Series I, uh, the, the, the following year. Um, was able to make the AAA team. And then uh, in 92, I got called up. And I did have a chance to start, but I was going through a terrible swing at the time. Uh, Greg Gagne got hurt. And so I didn't get, uh, I think I had probably 25 at bats. He played me for like a week. And it just wasn't going well for me offensively. Defensively, I was fine. And they kind of just decided, well, you're more valuable anyways as a utility guy. And I was probably okay with that because I was happy to be in the big leagues. And so I did that for the next few years. And then in 2003, after I left Baltimore and did all that, uh, 2003 um, with Pittsburgh, I got released by the Orioles in spring training. He took a rule five guy. Uh, and uh, I actually thought I'd made the team. Hargrove told me I made the team. Then he had to come back and tell me I didn't make the team. Uh, ended up in Pittsburgh, AAA getting ready again. Uh, after sitting at home for almost retiring and uh, what happened there. So I got called up, Pookie Reese blew out his thumb and gave me an opportunity, got called up. And a week later, I was starting every day at 39 years old for a couple of months. And I, know, I hit 310 for about a month or so, <laughs> 315, batting in the two hole. And uh, it was a fun, but it killed my body. I was so done. You know, and I was already doing the financial thing, which I do now uh, while I was playing. So uh, the next year when I went back to spring training, I'm like, unless I got a guaranteed contract, my body was shot. So I kind of just shut it down. Did you have a favorite position at all? If, if someone would have given you an opportunity and said, well, Jeff, you can put yourself in at, at any spot in the lineup card today. What, what would you have, to, what would you, what would you have decided? Yeah. As a utility guy, you're used to, you know, playing different positions. Um, if you haven't played somewhere in a while, like in certain organizations, uh, I had not played. Like in, in uh, L.A., I didn't play third base because they had Adrian, Adrian Beltre there. And, and I'm like, I hadn't been there in a month and a half or whatever. And they're like, you want to go play third, you know, or would you rather play short? I'm like, well, I hadn't played third in a while, and I felt like I needed to keep my skills up. But I went over there, and, of course, I was terrible. You know, just it's just a different angle. So for a utility guy, whatever you've been playing the most recently is what you want to play. You know, if you've been playing second base and they move you to short and you haven't been there a while, it's it's uh, it's a little nerve wracking. Like you you feel like uh, you're you hadn't been there in years. So that's really my thing as a utility guy. I never really enjoyed the outfield much. I know Davey stuck me out there for a start and right um, versus Carlos Perez. And, uh, you know, I didn't really screw anything up, but I just felt like, man, I just was really out of sorts there. I was a fish out of water. But uh, that's a tough position. It's a lot tougher than people realize. So it's first base. Like you go over there. Now, if you've been there a while and kind of get used to it, I mean, your, fir your first start over there, you had not been over there in a while, man, it's, it's, uh, you, there's a lot going on in your brain of what, what to do in certain situations. When to go get a ball. You know, you go too far, you got Robbie Alomar sitting over there. can cover a lot of ground. So you got to make decisions quickly. And uh, it's different throws and everything. But that's kind of my thing as a utility guy. Whatever you've been playing the most recently is probably where you're most comfortable. Uh, going back, Jeff, to your time in Baltimore, obviously the team was great in 97. Things did not work out uh, the way a lot of people hoped for in 98 and 99. But just uh, the atmosphere at the ballpark, the, the solid crowds, uh, the, the expecting uh, to win atmosphere and to play alongside the cows of the world and, and so many mm -hmm. other really you know, really good to great players. What was that experience like looking back at your career? 
It was great. I mean, obviously we expected to win. I almost felt like we had as good of a team, uh, if not maybe better in 98. I'm just trying to remember the differences, but, um, you know, just didn't work out. You know, sometimes things just don't flow the way they, you know, they you expect them to. And, you know, it's a long season and you lose a couple of games here or there and there's some things going on in the background that nobody knows about that usually happen. You know, there's things that are happening there. Um, I don't disagree with, you know, you know, uh, Ray Miller coming in or whatever. He was, you know, a great pitching coach. Um, I think the communication sometimes got a little lost with some of the veteran guys. Uh, but, you know, that we just didn't get it done when we needed to get it done. And we had the talent. And for whatever reason, it just didn't work out. And in 99, it, it dropped off more, you know, and we still had a pretty good team. So, and at that point, there was a lot of uh, transactions happening. Uh, and I think Kevin Malone got fired or what have you. And then there's this changeover and, and then it's rebuild, right? And at that point, you know, people are looking for the exits. I can remember Richie Amaral and myself were sitting here late in the year going, we got to get out of here or we're going to be gone. Like we're not going to play. And I ended up getting traded for a, a double a infielder that they released a week later, which got me to Kansas city and kept my career going. And I actually did well over there. Richie, I think ended up, didn't get traded, hung around and was released early in the next season. And that's kind of how, you know, as a veteran guy, you kind of see those things coming when they're rebuilding like that. And as a, as a, as a guy like myself or anybody who's on the bench, you're a kind of a luxury item. You need to be on really good teams or they're going to, they don't really need you. They want the, rook, the young guys to come up and try and learn. And, you know, they don't want to pay you to, for whatever that reason is. And uh, so you got to try and find places. And in Kansas city, they had a younger team and they needed a veteran guy who could kind of work with guys and young guys. And uh, it was a joy going over there. And then I was able to move on from there to LA. And then uh, for two years, uh, had a chance to start there a little bit late in the year. Uh, we almost got in the playoffs and then uh, ended up in Pittsburgh in, in uh, 2003. When you go back to that 97 ALCS, do you think maybe some of the, the problems in that series came from a, a little bit of a letdown that it, that it wasn't the Yankees? Because after what happened the previous year, uh, when they, they fell to New York and you have the Jeffrey Mayer incident that happens, um, was there maybe any talk that that, that had something to, to maybe do with what happened after you guys had beaten the Mariners? No, not really. Um, I don't think we really feared anybody. Um, I think what happened was, uh, yeah, there's, there's some underlying things that go on there, but we just didn't play as well as we had been playing. We went through a little stretch where, you know, some of our, uh, I think Rafi struggled a little bit getting guys in. They had this lefty coming in on him every time. And for whatever reason, he struggled with him. And there was a lot of big situations where that guy pitched really well. And that was just, you know, one of those guys that you face that seemed to always be right there at the wrong time for us. Um, you know, so that, that kind of struggled, but um, I think there was, if you recall in that series, there's a lot of weird plays that went on and things that cost us games, like the, the, the foul tip, uh, you know, squeeze play, you know, that we think is, you know, that, that ended the game right there. And, you know, we win that game, we probably go on to win. There was uh, extra inning stuff going on. Um, there was just some weird, weird things that happened in that series that kind of put us back. One of the big things was they had uh, Armando Benitez's pitches, so he struggled, right? So when you go in there, and I've talked to Marquise Grissom about this as well, because I play with him in LA, and I still do things with Marquise once in a while, but he was deathly ill. Marquise was like on his, they weren't sure he was going to play. He was taking IVs. He gets up there. We blow a couple of fastballs by him. We're up uh, two in the ninth, by, uh, top of the – no, uh, I guess it's been top of the ninth. And Marquise comes up, and, and after throwing a couple of fastballs by him, hits a slider or a split for a three-run homer and could not catch up to the high heater. So, for whatever reason, they kind of – they knew the fastball was coming and they couldn't hit it. But when they knew a breaking ball was coming, they could sit on a little better and maybe make contact. And uh, he ended up hitting a three-run homer. And that turned that whole series because that's game two. We go, you know, we go into Cleveland up 2-0 versus now it's 1-1. One one. We got to win in Cleveland a couple times, right? So, and then with the crazy things that happened in Cleveland with all the crazy games, extra innings, and the things going on, you know, we 
we needed to win game six, which was difficult. And Mucina pitched his butt off and we just couldn't get the runs in to drive him in. And so I, I think we were the better team. Um, and I would have liked that Marlins matchup because we played them earlier in the year and it was in Florida and it was, it was big boy baseball. You could tell, you know, everybody thought it was us in Atlanta. We played Atlanta and we kind of really walked through Atlanta uh, during the season, but man, my Florida had a good team. So that would have been interesting. And clearly Cleveland was playing well and they made it close. Yeah. And the uh, final pitch of the series was about 10 feet off the plate inside to Roberto Alomar and it was called a strike. Yeah. Uh, yeah so that was that's the way, that's the way it ended. Unfortunately, there's a lot of that going on and uh, you know, you can't blame it on umpires with everything going on, of course. but it was, there was some crazy stuff that happened. It just, you know, it was, a great experience for me. I mean, it was nerve wracking as heck. There was some things going on in the field. We weren't sure we were going with the ball. And, you know, I got Hall of Fame guys next to me. What are you going to do? I don't know. What are you going to do? And Davey came out to the mound and it was extra innings. And he's like, hey, I don't care. You know, don't, you know, hit, turn the double play, but don't let them score. And they had three fast guys on the field. Like, we can't do that. There's no way. They're too fast. So we kind of were deciding what to do. And then right before the last pitch is thrown, Cal goes, I'm going home. So Robbie looks at me and he goes, I'm going home. I'm like, okay, we're going home. So we played in and the next ball is a rocket to third. Cal dives and gets it from his knees, kind of looks over at third and flips it to first from his knees, I think, and gets the out. We got out, ended up getting out of the inning. But after that play, he looks at me and he goes, did we have the double play? Did we have him at second? I'm like, no, there's nobody, there's nobody there. We just decided that 10 seconds ago. So it's just kind of the craziness that goes on in a world, you know, our playoff game. And uh, those plays are decided. And, you know, we made some of them. And uh, Cleveland just made a few more of them, got a few more breaks, in my opinion. Uh, Jeff, when you went to junior college, you had an opportunity to play with, with Kirby Puckett. Uh, what do you remember uh, about him as a player? Because you, you play with a number of Hall of Famers with the Orioles and uh, Puckett obviously reached the Hall of Fame as well. And to me, maybe somebody that was forgot about a little bit uh, from some of those great players in the 90s. Yeah, Puck was awesome, man. He was uh, he was actually a friend of mine. Um, we went to Triton Junior College together. That's my jersey in the background. Uh, we're both in the Hall of Fame there with Lance Johnson and the uh, Bob Simmons uh, coach there. And there's been a lot of great players come out of there. So we have a little bond beforehand. But going to Minnesota, he kind of took me under his wing a little bit, took care of me. Um, but watching him play, um, he was just was so much fun to watch, man. It, that, that guy, being small in stature, just hit missiles. Like, I mean, rockets everywhere. And he could run. Nobody really realized that he ran a 6-2, 60 on the track at Triton uh, before he got drafted, which is, you know, world-class speed. Um, and he could, you know, he, so you hit a ground ball and he's running down the line. You had to hurry like an Ichiro almost. Like he was getting it and he smoked the ball. So great player, had a cannon for an arm, just controlled the clubhouse. Um, but the, the beauty of Puck was that not many people know is that was one of the funniest dudes that I ever played with. Like that, every day he had me, between him and Randy Bush, who's now uh, assistant GM in Chicago with the Cubs, the, he was dry, Bushy was dry, but Puck would make you laugh so hard, and Herbeck was funny as well. And those three going all day long, man, I was in tears. I mean, literally, I would, I would laugh so hard, I would cry every day. And, uh, you know, baseball is stressful and what have you, but these guys made it fun, man. And, I mean, everybody you talk to that played with Puck, you, they – they know like this guy was just fun to be around and just a great competitor. And uh, quite frankly, he saved my career. My uh, second year in, I hadn't been known as a hitter, obviously never was, uh, but I could swing it a little bit. And I used an H238 of 3431, which is kind of like, uh, I think uh, Griffey used, I think Bonds might use it too, but it's a bigger barrel, thinner handle. And I would swing that around and I do my thing. And, I'm playing, and, and before a game, we're taking batting practice in, in uh, I guess it was Cleveland. And before the game, Puck must have known something, because I wasn't, I was hitting like 170 or something. I don't know what I was hitting. And it wasn't going well. Um, they had taken me and started using his bats, which were 35, 35, 36, 35. And they had me choking up halfway on the barrel, on the, on, on the bat, and trying to shoot everything in the right field. And for a week, 10 days, I'm doing this, and it's terrible. Like, I'm flying out there jamming me. This is the worst experience of my life. And he finally comes up to me, and he knew something was going on. He comes up in batting practice, didn't really notice what was going on. He goes, hey, Rev, he goes, he goes, you know, you're struggling, whatever. He goes, you know, sometimes you got to do what got you here. You're a good player. 
you you got here because you're a good player doing what you do. You know, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do and just go back to what you what makes you good, right? And you know, there's gonna be a lot of people talking about a lot of things you got to do. Just do, just be you. I'm like, okay. So during that game, I go up and I make another out, and Tom Kelly, using some frank terms, says, "You better start getting some bleepity bleep hits." You know, I don't care what bat you use, but you can go use the thin bat or you can use the big bat, but whatever you're doing ain't working. And you're embarrassing your family and your friends. He goes, just start getting some hits. So that's the kind of stuff you deal with in the big leagues, right? So I take Puck's advice, you know, and Terry Crowley was our hitting coach at the time too. So I had to look Crow in the eye, who was a great hitting coach, man. Crow was the best. He really was. But they were trying to work on this new approach. And I look at Crow, and I went back and got one of Scotty Leas' two T one forty ones, which is a thin bat. I didn't even have mine on the road. And from then on, got twelve more or eleven more years in the big league. So I owe Puck a lot for that. Um, I actually have the last glove he ever played with, and uh, he gave it to me when he, his eye went bad. And he goes, "You keep it. You know, you're going to need it more than I am right now." And uh, so I still have that. But that guy was a special person, man. In the game, missed a lot because he had a lot left to play. Do you have your uh, home runoff Randy Johnson in the ALDS? Uh, I have the bat, and I ended up using it again. I broke it uh, somewhere in the playoffs. I think it was in Cleveland. So I still have it. It's got a crack in it somewhere. Um, I don't dis- – you know, I have a, some things I display, but none of it's my own stuff. But, uh, uh, yeah, I still have that. Um, I got a lot of stuff from just, you know, back in the day. Uh, nobody really knows that I have it, but uh, – uh, I got some pretty cool stuff. Uh, Puck, actually, when uh, he was done, uh, he gave me one of his, uh, the metal plating that they put for uh, for uh, newspapers back in the day. They used to have the plates. Uh, he gave me one of those plates. And uh, I can't remember what it was for. It must have been for a retirement or something. Uh, well, it must have been the Hall of Fame, maybe. I don't know what it was. But I have that. So I have some really cool stuff. But uh, – yeah, man, it's uh, it's interesting when you play this game long enough. You run across a bunch of guys. You see some amazing things. You meet amazing people, and uh, and he was he was one of those guys. And of course, the Orioles in '97, man, has just a, a a crazy group of guys. Man, it was a lot of fun and a lot of good players to play together. <laughs> uh, last one, uh, Jeff. Tell us what you're doing right now and your connection to baseball still. Yeah, so um, right now I'm a financial advisor. I have a lot of uh, uh, former players and current players and uh, minor league guys as clients. Uh, Brian Bass in Baltimore is in our Baltimore office. Um, is also works with me, and and we have affiliations with other groups. We have a broker dealer we deal with, so we're doing that. Uh, we travel around and go see guys. I uh, still get to stay in the game that way. Go to spring training and do things. Players Association, Major League Baseball Players Association. I've been working with them for a long time. I do their rookie career development program. Um, that's a joint venture with them and MLB. Brings in the top prospects uh, for four days to talk about life in the big leagues. So I'm one of the 10 former players they bring back to uh, have discussions with those guys. And it, it talks about how to deal with the media, all kinds of things. But as a former player, we can help them and mentor them. So I still have a lot of contacts with guys like that. Um, uh, Trey Mancini was one of my guys, a good dude. And I wish the best for Trey. Um, a lot of uh, Adam Jones I had a lot of guys in my small group. Um, and then there's guys that are in the big group, but we usually get about 10 guys in a group and that's pretty cool. I work with youth baseball on the youth advisory board for major league baseball players association. And uh, we're trying to make youth baseball a little bit better. Again, it's kind of getting out of hand. So uh, a lot of good things there. And other than that, I, I run an organization, a nonprofit for uh, baseball here locally in Dayton, Ohio, where I'm from and uh, just getting kids out playing and, and uh, trying to grow the great game of baseball. And then doing my thing here, uh, and then like I said, Brian has a has an office in uh, in Baltimore, and we're busy with that, man. That's what we do all the time. Well, that all sounds awesome. Uh, it sounds like you've had a very fulfilling uh, post baseball career after twelve big league seasons, three with the Orioles, twenty regular season home runs, but one very special one in the postseason off Randy Johnson that helped the Orioles seal the deal against a uh, powerful Mariners ball club. Jeff, that was awesome. Thank you so much for going back down memory lane with us. Well, thanks for the great questions and uh, best to you guys. And hopefully we'll be back playing soon. And uh, go O's, man. We uh, love to see them have a great year. Well, that's Rebs, or Rebby as they called him. Jeff Rebele, 
Again, 12 big league seasons, three with the Orioles, the monster blast of Randy Johnson in the clinching ALDS game of 1997 at Camden Yards. But really a guy, you know, Jeff, we've been around this long enough to know, uh, podcast and beyond, the guys you know you can talk for like another three hours with. And Jeff Rebel is one of those guys. I mean, we could have gone down the rabbit hole of Tom Kelly or any, any coach or, or teammate he ever had and just had a lot of great baseball stories. I mean, how about that story about what Tom Kelly told him walking ah. down into the dugout and the advice that he got from his buddy Kirby Puckett, uh, which eventually helped Rebel A get things back on track and ultimately put together a 12-year uh, major league career. You're embarrassing here, but, your family right? and your friends. <sighs> Hey, you know what? Tom Kelly was a, was a great manager. In great manager. Two rings, right? Fant yeah, fantastic with the Minnesota Twins. And then he played for some great managers when you think about it. Tom Kelly, Davey Johnson. I mean, he, he played for some really good ones and had an extended career. With Like we said, going that long as a utility player, you can't point to a whole lot of utility men that spent 12 years in the, in the major leagues. But Rebele managed to do it. And his recall and his storytelling, I, I really enjoyed the part about Roberto Alomar where he talked about that, that Alomar might have been uh, the best player that, that he ever played with. And it's been interesting, maybe on this podcast, we've had some of these conversations with players both during the podcast and maybe off air as well about how – you're getting a lot of people that talk about in, in those teams in the 90s, maybe the best player uh, that was was there, five tools, uh, would have been Roberto Alomar for, for what he provided yeah. in his short time with the Orioles. No, I would agree that Alomar you know, was in the top three or four uh, most talented players I ever saw play, uh, especially up close. But uh, beyond that, the work ethic of Alomar, Cal, and Bordick I think is really interesting because, you know, obviously there's a, there's a, a huge level of skill to get to the big leagues. And I think we often kind of take that for granted. But, you know, Ripken moving from short to third, late in his career, the flips we saw Roberto Alomar make, it, it felt like he was just purely improvising in those moments, but he clearly spent, you know, hours a week on everything you saw on game day. And then what he said about our colleague, Mike Bordick, uh, no truer words probably ever spoken about uh, Mike Bordick. If it was a ground ball to Bordick, it was an out. And, and that's the reality of it. So, uh, what an infield, what a ball team, and uh, and so much fun reminiscing with Rebelay. And don't forget Rafael Palmero as far as defensive players go, too. I mean, he, he had so many good years offensively with the Orioles, but you don't maybe consider the fact that he was a gold glove caliber first baseman, too. And it was funny because when I was – I think it was my second to last year in the Carolina League before coming up there, and you talk about Rob, Roberto Alomar doing all the glove flips and things like that. Omar Vizquel – uh, he was managing the Winston-Salem dash and he would get out on the field during batting practice and he would do a lot of those same things. Even uh, the fact that I think this girl is probably right around 50, something like that, probably, actually, probably a little older than 50. He can still do all those glove flips and those kinds of things. And, you know, I would imagine that somebody like Roberto Alomar, you could put him out on the infield, have him take some ground balls. And I'm sure he could still do some of those tricks too. All right, a lot of fun today uh, speaking with Jeff Rebelay and uh, Jeff Arnold. That was fun. It was a blast. I think that was one of our better episodes with Jeff Rebelay. And wow. You're right. We could have gone on with him for probably another hour or so and, and get some more of those great stories because he's got a lot of them. All right, well, that does it for us today. Be safe and well, everyone. Until next time, this has been Orioles Magic, the podcast presented by Miller Lite.